Publius Cornelius Lentulus Sura, Consul 71 BCE. Despite serving as consul, it was Lentulus Sura's involvement in the Catalinarian conspiracy eight years later which earned him his place in history. In Cicero's account of the Catalinarian conspiracy, he and Catiline are the central figures. In Sallust's account, written approximately 25 years after the event, Caesar and Cato the Younger both received special attention due to their debate over the fate of the conspirators and their importance in the years following the conspiracy. However, when we look at the Catalinarian conspiracy on its own terms, it is clear that there were political actors who were much more important to the course of events than either Caesar or Cato. In 63, Pompey and Crassus were respectively the first and second most powerful and wealthy senators in Rome. Quintus Lutatius Catulus Capitolinus was the most senior figure of the Optimates, and he spoke against Caesar's plan to imprison the conspirators before Cato. Undoubtedly, Catulus had more impact on the proceedings due to his higher rank and greater actoritas. Gaius Antonius Hybrida, while he is typically regarded with scorn by the sources or viewed as an empty toga by modern scholars, was Cicero's consular colleague and a man who was clearly pursuing his own agenda in 63. While Catiline himself was the father of the conspiracy and a charismatic leader people could and did flock to, there was another man who was just as responsible for the planning and execution of the conspiracy. Lentulus Sura, a former consul purged by a censor from his own family, handled the part of the conspiracy taking place in Rome itself. In this capacity, he could and did make major alterations to Catiline's plans. Such were the magnitude of Lentulus Sura's decisions that it would not be unfair to rename the entire conspiracy after Lentulus Sura. In this video, I will argue that although Catiline's conspiracy had very little chance of achieving success, Lentulus Sura's high-placed involvement completely eliminated any chance of a successful outcome. While he is less famous than Metellus Scipio, Lentulus Sura was just as incompetent and every bit as much of a millstone around the necks of his friends and family members. The Lentuli were a prominent branch of the patrician Gens Cornelia. While there were other branches which were more prominent, the Scipiones come to mind, the Lentuli had been doing very well for themselves for a couple of centuries by this point. By the time that Lentulus Sura became consul in 71, at least 12 of his relatives had held the office before him. One of them, Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus Clodianus, was even consul in 72, just the year before. So the late 70s for the Lentulus family were quite good years. Interestingly enough, while Lentulus Clodianus was most likely a cousin of Lentulus Sura, the two of them do not seem to have been allies. Usually people are allied with their near relatives, but in this case it would appear that that was not the case. Sura, assuming that he had an optimal path along the Cursus Anorum, was most likely born in either 114 or 113. This would make him 42 or 43 when he held his consulship in 71. There is the possibility that his career was delayed by up to as much as five years, however, by the period of Senna's dominance in Rome. Senna tended to retain the same officials year after year, and this did impede the careers of many Romans. So it's possible that Sura is actually up to five years older than this, and he was actually born around 119 or so BCE. There's another interesting fact about Sula's family, or Sura's family life. He was Mark Antony's stepfather, and for most of his career, he was also a close ally of Gaius Antonius Hybrida, who was Mark Antony's uncle. Most likely, he became Antony's stepfather due to his relationship with Antony's uncle. Of course, at the time, Mark Antony was just some kid, and it was not really all that obvious that he would go on to achieve great things. To be fair, as we've discussed in the past, Antony's grandfather was one of the great men of the Senate in his own time. But this video is not about Mark Antony, we're talking about his stepfather, Lentulus Sura.
We're now five minutes into the video, and I imagine that a number of you are wondering why I chose to put Sura in quotation marks. I've never done this before with a previous cognomen. The reason is simple. Sura is not a cognomen. It is a simple nickname in the modern sense. Lynchulus earned this nickname while serving as a junior magistrate under the dictator Sulla. In 81, Sulla was still holding the office of dictator, and Lynchulus was serving under him as a keister. Sulla was unabashedly pro-patrician and more or less defended the interest of his social order in a fairly shameless and nude way. Lynchulus apparently was working rather closely with the dictator on public finance, and Sulla was keeping a lookout on Lynchulus's activities. Sulla effectively summoned Lynchulus and accused him of squandering or appropriating public money, and he expected Lynchulus as a junior official to render an account of his expenses and to explain where the public money had gone. Rather than doing that, Lynchulus didn't say a word. He simply lifted up his toga to expose his calves and receive a blow. In the Roman bathhouses, this is what bath attendants would do if they had displeased their masters so they could receive what was the Roman equivalent of a slap on the wrist. Lynchulus, in the event, understood the situation correctly. Sulla would not punish him for mere peculation and he escaped unscathed. He got the proverbial slap on the wrist for his misappropriation of public funds. In fact, if you study Sulla's dictatorship, you realize that he let a whole lot of crime go unpunished so long as the people doing it were his political allies. Due to this freshness in the face of a dictator, Lynchulus earned the nickname Sura Cavs. Some people translate it as legs lentulus, which sounds good, but I don't think quite conveys it. I like to use the word sura because it sounds kind of like the English word surly, and it just shows you that lentulus was a relatively shameless guy. At first, I imagine this nickname was somewhat in jest and maybe even a kind of form of praise for lentulus's ballsiness, but over time, especially after his involvement in the Catalinarian conspiracy, this nickname came to take on some more negative connotations as Lynchulus proved to be more shameless than was good for the health of the Republic. Like all of his contemporaries going into the 70s, Lynchulus Sura was operating in the post solon order, a political situation really designed to benefit people like him. The combination of the civil wars of the 80s and the prescriptions of Sulla effectively wiped out the proto-populares and more or less only left the conservative faction intact. There were some people who survived the purges, but for the most part, they kept a low profile for most of the 70s. Some adherents of Marius, such as Caesar, were able to escape and later would reemerge, but because Caesar was both a patrician and a young man who had not yet held an office, Sulla didn't really bear him much ill will. Supposedly, Sulla said that in Caesar he sees a thousand Mariuses, but this was not enough to lead him to want to murder Caesar. However, let's not make any mistakes about it. The people who followed Sulla the most carefully were the ones who were the winners and would control the politics of the next decade. Pompey the Great, who in no way adhered to the curse of the norm that Sulla was trying to institute into a rock-solid thing that Romans would have to go through, was one of the superstars of the time, just because of who his allies were. Electorally, as the decade carried on, though, some of the Sullan reforms proved to be unwieldy. The neutering of the tribuneship, for instance, posed a problem for ambitious politicians. And some of the people who were not at the top of the Solon heap began to decide to go in a more popularist direction in order to find support. There was electoral space for that. A lot of the people who had backed Marius and Senna were still around, or people in a similar social situation who might benefit from a more populist approach to politics. So eventually some of the people who were part of this victorious Solon coalition went in the popularist direction to advance their own personal careers. 
and it would appear that both Lentulus Sura and his good friend Gaius Antonius Hybrida eventually became populares over the course of the 70s because that was where the action was and that was their best path to finding some sort of political relevance. At any rate, we do know that whatever Sura and Hybrida considered themselves, in Pompey's eyes, they were political opponents and they were violating the Solon order in some way, so he was adamant to have them removed from the Senate. We don't really know the details of Lentulus Sura's consulship in 71. The rebellion of Spartacus was still ongoing at the time, but it does not appear that Lentulus Sura played a part in that conflict. His cousin Lentulus Clodianus, the consul 72, however, did play a part as he led an army against Spartacus and was completely humiliated. Lentulus Clodianus then became an ally of Pompey, who sponsored him for the censorship later in 70. Whatever Lentulus Sura did, it would appear that he most likely managed to offend Pompey, or possibly both Pompey and his cousin, and at any rate, uh, the two of them were willing to work together to try to get rid of Lentulus Sura. My guess would be that if Lentulus Sura did anything which offended and alienated Pompey, anything specific that is, aside from being a popularis, then most likely it was that he was critical of the way that the Senate had handled the war, possibly either critical of Lentulus Clodianus's generalship or critical of the Senate's attempts to get Pompey involved in the war. It's also possible that because Pompey and Crassus were bitter enemies at this time that Lentulus Sura had been an advocate of empowering Crassus and therefore Pompey wanted him to pay. In 70, the censors, who, one of whom was Lentulus Clodianus, voted to remove about 60 or so senators, and one of them was Lentulus Sura. He was accused of immorality, which is usually code for corruption, but code for corruption in a way which is very vague and unspecified. There's no trial required for the censors to expel someone. It's simply a judgment call on their part. They purge this person from the roles of the Senate. Another person who was purged this time for somewhat more clear reasons, but also because he was on the wrong side of Pompey, was Antonius Hybrida. Although, to be fair, there was a clearer case to be made about him being corrupt, since as a governor, he had engaged in some corrupt practices. With Lentulus Sura, we don't really know what, if anything, he did to deserve this treatment. The real reason that both Lentulus Sura and Antonius Hybrida were expelled is because Pompey, the political patron of the two consuls, wanted them gone. After his expulsion from the Senate in the year 70, Lentulus Sura quickly got back into the game of politics and began to climb the ladder once more. By 63, he was once again a praetor. He would serve in this capacity as one of Catiline's chief allies. It's worth mentioning with Catiline that until at least the year 65, he was a senator who commanded at least some respect from the likes of Catulus, the senior senator on the Optimate side, and Cicero, who actually considered defending Catiline when he was put on trial for corruption. Most of them did not see him as in any way beyond the pale, and for the most part, he was viewed positively, so far as we can tell. Catiline came from an ancient and fallen patrician family, and he was the first person in about 200 years from his family to seek high office. So his was a comeback story, and he seems to have enjoyed quite a bit of popularity. He had charisma, and he also seems to have had quite a distinguished war record. He was known for physical vigor and for being an extremely brave guy. His career definitely took a hit in 66-65 when he was accused of corruption after serving as the pro Praetorian governor in Africa. And although he was acquitted, the quip later by Cicero is that the reason why he got off is because he left the trial as poor as many of his judges entered it. 
meaning that he bribed all of the judges in order to get off. At any rate, while this was a setback and while this trial did delay Catiline's run for the consulship by an entire year, he did decide to run for the consulship in 63, which means that he actually was running in 64 to win the office in 63. Hope I explained that well enough. He announced his candidacy on June 1st, 64, and during his run for the consulship, his most prominent supporter by a mile was Lentulus Sura. The reason why he had shed support between his earlier attempts to reach high office and the middle of 64 is due one to the loss of all that wealth in his trial and also some prestige on his name, but also because one of his platform items was running on the abolition of debt. We'll come back to that point in a minute. By the time he was running for consul, however, Lynchula Sura was his most prominent supporter, although there were some young men with prominent names who were also in his camp. Lucius Calpurnia Bestia, Lucius Cassius Longinus, and then Publius and Servius Sulla, the nephews of the dictator. So while Catiline is often painted as someone who is only supported by debtors and slaves and um, random degenerates, there were some people who came from some pretty prominent families who were in his corner, and not all of them were super young. By this point, Lentula Sura is about 50. So a lot of the portrayal that Cicero and even Sallust puts forward of the kinds of people who supported Catiline is fairly oversimplified. Catiline ran for consul twice, once in 64 for the office in 63, and a second time in 63 to hold the office in 62. The first time he ran, he partnered with Sura's good friend Gaius Antonius Hybrida, and he was running on the issue of tabula novi, that is, the erasure of debts, or new tablets. This is something which effectively did unify the optimates in opposition. Despite his misgivings about engaging in election fraud, Cato the Younger agreed to help rig the process to ensure that Catiline didn't get elected. And the optimates threw their support behind the Novus Homo Cicero and Antonius Hybrida. This ensured that the first 18 centuries of 35 would decide the outcome and that poor people would not get to vote to erase their debts. Um, the Roman election system was very much built to favor the wealthy and um, by tilting the scales in this way, by having all of the senators work to win over their clients within these first 18 tribes to vote a certain way, they ensured that Catiline would not be able to cancel debts. The reason why they didn't want him to cancel debts is because, in many cases, they indirectly controlled those debts. Roman senators were not supposed to engage in business directly, but they often did things under the table or behind the scenes, and many of them held debts from, uh, from various uh, people. So this was something that they were not inclined to see happen. In 63, when Catiline ran a second time, he was unable to recapture the same support he had enjoyed since in 64 he had been fairly close to winning before the Senate really put its finger on the scale. And this time he finished a very clear third. According to Sallust and Cicero, in order to run these two campaigns, Catiline had to contract massive debt and his reason for running on the issue of tabulae novi is because of that same personal debt. In 63, following Catiline's second unsuccessful bid for the consulship, the second and real Catalinarian conspiracy occurred. There is a first Catalinarian conspiracy in 66-65. Most likely, this was complete and total bunk, and it was a post facto smear job by Cicero and others who were trying to implicate Crassus and, C and Caesar into Catiline's criminal activities in their mind. But the second conspiracy in 63 is quite real. After being cheated twice effectively, although the first time was much more clear than the second, Catiline and his supporters felt betrayed and they sought vengeance against those who had wronged them. 
you have to remember that when talking about ancient aristocrats, one of their key motives is their own personal honor. If they feel that their honor has been violated, if they feel that they have been deprived of their birthright, which is to participate in politics and hold magistracies, then they will often lash out violently. Sallust claims that Catiline and most of his chief adherents were desperately indebted and were acting from essentially selfish motives and personal desperation. That may be the case for some of them. However, my suspicion is that this is more or less a case of traditional aristocratic anger. Despite Cicero's rhetoric about Catiline's intention to burn down Rome and arm and free the slaves, Catiline's actual plan seems to have been to appeal to poor free citizens and to change the political fortunes of himself and his allies and not to bring about some radical social transformation. Even the cancellation of debts would more or less just reset the scoreboard without actually changing the structure of society. So Catiline was not some sort of a Marxist hero or some sort of a reformer like the Gracchi even. He was simply someone who felt that he and his friends had been wronged and he wanted to address that grievance and put himself in his rightful place, that is, as one of the consuls of Rome. I won't go through too many of the details of the original plan that Catiline and his supporters came up with, as that plan had to be scrapped and Lynch Lysura does not feature too prominently in that plan. Suffice to say that their original plan was leaking from at least one source. There was one of the conspirators who was telling his mistress all about how great he was going to be, and she decided to cash in on that and went and told Cicero about what was happening. Cicero then gathered information from her and also from other sources, and he was well aware of what was happening. This enabled him to start to act in a way which showed awareness, he began to raise citizens as special marshals to look out for the Catalinarians, and he also began to spread basically what amounts to a smear that Catiline and his supporters were going to start setting fires throughout Rome. Rome at this time was a fire trap, so this was something sure to inspire fear in the hearts of anyone who heard about it. So Cicero was posting armed men throughout the city, and Catiline and his crew figure out that Cicero is aware of their plans. One thing they don't do is try to patch the holes in their organization and try to impose secrecy, which is a bad decision on their part. They decide to up their timeline. So they take two of the men from their group and they have them go to Cicero's morning audience and to pose as people asking for a favor and then the plan is that they will just whip out their daggers, murder Cicero, create a panic, and then in the panic, the conspirators will come out and seize everything. That plan quickly falls apart because Cicero doesn't receive visitors that morning. He knows who these guys are, and they're not admitted. So this plan has to be scrapped, and now they have to come up with a new plan. In the new plan, Lynchula Sura and Gaius Cethegus, another major Catalinarian conspirator, were to see some key points in Rome while Catiline himself joined some indebted farmers in Etruria. Most of these guys would have been veterans of Sulla who got land and had no idea what to do with it because they were probably from the city of Rome and had never farmed before, and now they were bankrupt. And then he would take this group of Solan veterans and march on Rome to relieve Sura and Cethegus, and together they would set up a new regime where Catiline would become consul and maybe Lynchula Sura would be his colleague or one of the other senior guys. And yeah, then all would be right as far as they were concerned. Maybe they would enforce the Tabula Novi or maybe not. The point was to get the power and to right the wrongs that had been done to them personally. So uh, this was the plan such as it was. It was not a good plan. But one thing that Catiline was clear on is that they could not recruit slaves because this would very much turn off the average Roman. And they also could not set fire to anything because of the obvious risk to the city of Rome. Keep in mind, Catiline did not want to destroy Rome. He simply wanted to elevate his place in the city's political order. So burning down the city would not serve that purpose at all. 
someone online created an imagined portrait of Lynch Lassura, and he envisioned him as being kind of a mix of the Emperor Palpatine and Lincoln Chafee from Rhode Island. So kind of an interesting choice, and I, I like this image a lot. I almost would be willing to use this as a thumbnail, if not for the fact that I need to put the Conspiracy of Catiline in the thumbnail so people know why Lynch List matters. But that's neither here nor there. As the oldest and most senior of the conspirators, currently serving as a praetor, Lynch Lysura was Catiline's right-hand man, and he would be in charge in Rome while Catiline was absent collecting the Solon veterans to march on the city. One could argue that it was inevitable that Catiline would have to turn to Lentulus as his chief lieutenant. After all, this was very much the Roman way. If you were senior in rank, especially if you were a current magistrate, you would be expected to play a prominent part. Lentulus was the only one of Catiline's followers in 63 who had ever exercised imperium in any form and was also the only person in an office at that time who was exercising Imperium. So in theory, Lentulus could claim to be acting legitimately as a magistrate of the Senate and people while he was commanding men. So perhaps it is inevitable that Lentulus had to play the leading role. That being said, arguably, Catiline's trust in Sura was his biggest mistake. Lentulus Sura very much had his own ideas about how to do things, and as we'll see, his ideas were, frankly, stupid. Lentulus Sura would prove to be politically inept, slow to act, disloyal, and given to delusions of grandeur. In addition, Lentulus Sura feuded constantly with Gaius Cethegus, who believed that Lentulus was incompetent and indecisive. So, let's see how Lentulus performs once Catiline leaves the city. According to our sources, the driving force behind Lentulus's megalomaniacal ambitions was a supposed Sibylline prophecy which said that three Cornelii were destined to rule Rome. He assumed that Senna was the first, Sulla was the second, and he, Lentulus Sura, would be the third. He became obsessed with this prophecy, one which apparently few people knew about, and decided that it should be him rather than Catiline who would control the city after the conspiracy succeeded. As soon as Catiline was out of the city and in Etruria, this is after Cicero delivers the first Catilinarian oration, Catiline denied everything and then left voluntarily, supposedly to abate tensions. Lentulus cast aside Catiline's instructions and then began to act as he thought best. He also seems to have been contemplating refusing to hand over command to Catiline when Catiline arrived with Sulla's veterans to bail out himself and Cethegus while they would inevitably be besieged by the many guards that Cicero had raised to protect the city. So uh, this was at the heart of Lentulus's thinking. His delusions were driven by a personal ambition which had always been there but was now spurred by a supposed Sibylline prophecy. I stand firmly with Gulasi and other modern scholars who say that Catiline's core strategy was to appeal to poor Romans who had debt and to avoid alienating them by bringing up the specter of armed slaves. Keep in mind, 63 is only about eight years after the end of Spartacus's rebellion. Armed slaves are still a thing of nightmares for most Romans. However, Lentulus Sura, despite being an ex-consul, seems to have lacked much in the way of political sense. One of his first decisions was that the conspirators would start recruiting and arming slaves. And again, remember that Lentulus Sura, Catiline, and all the other senior leaders made no efforts to plug the holes in their conspiracy and make sure that Cicero wouldn't find out about what was going on, even though they knew that there were leaks. So, obviously, once Cicero learns about this, he begins to talk about it. And once the Roman people learn that among the conspirators are armed slaves, they begin to panic, and support for Catiline begins to diminish, 
while support for Cicero and the Senate keeping order increases. Cicero also made up a bunch of stories about setting fires because he knew that this was another boogeyman, and because the people that the conspirators were now bringing in were slaves who had nothing to lose, the story about fires became a lot more plausible. So again, Lentulus Sura was playing directly in the Cicero's hands. For whatever reason, even though he was bleeding support over time, and all of his delays were giving Cicero more and more time to learn about the details of his plot, Lentulus decided that he would wait until December 16th, a full month. And December 16th is significant because it's the day before the Saturnalia. He chose this date for symbolic reasons. The Saturnalia is a festival where social roles are reversed because he's reversing his own fortunes and those of his allies with this great conspiracy. So this delay ends up really hurting their chances even more. And again, to be clear, I don't think the chances were ever that high regardless of what Catiline and Lentulus did, but Lentulus's actions were making those chances go from slim to none. The plan on December 16th was for the Tribune Lucius Calpurnius Bestia to summon a tribal assembly, whip the crowd up into a frenzy, and then have them storm Cicero's house and murder him. This being despite all of the armed guards around Rome. And then the conspirators would kidnap Pompey's kids, seize some key points in the city, such as the Capitoline Hill, and hold out until Catiline and the Solon veterans arrived to bail them out. This, of course, is a poor strategy at best. So just to review the problems with Lentulus Sura's strategy, one was that he had never gotten along well with Gaius Cethegus, and now Cethegus was deeply disturbed by Lentulus's plan. He does not seem to have had much of a problem with Lentulus's decision to recruit slaves, and as we'll see, he also raised no objection to Lentulus's decision to involve the Allobrogues. However, he did see the necessity of striking early. He knew that over time, the Senate would become more organized. So he thought that if they could act quickly, they would have a better chance. His idea was to seize the Senate in session, take the whole body hostage, and then negotiate from there. In Lentulus's defense, his delay did have the added benefit of giving Catiline more time to get his army ready and armed. So there is some reason behind Lentulus's plan. However, all things considered, I think Cethegus may have had a better idea here. Sura's idea to recruit slaves combined with Cicero's warnings about arson, as I mentioned earlier, caused a steady shift in public opinion until the poor were firmly with Cicero by December of 63. It would appear that as late as November, some people were totally fine with Catiline's plan. Many of them had debts, and they also really didn't care that much for the Senate. So they were either willing to look the other way or even actively help out the conspirators. But after the specter of arson was raised and armed slaves committing that arson, many poor citizens decided that they were just fine with their debts. Please save us from these armed slaves with their torches. Another problem again is that no matter what strategy Sura and his associates came up with, they had no ability to keep secrets, so anything that they came up with would be telegraphed immediately to Cicero. Lentulus, as the guy left behind in Rome, should have and could have done things to fill in some of these holes and to try to make his conspiracy more secret. But he failed to do this, and as the leader in Rome and the senior member of this conspiracy, he is the primary culprit when it comes to not plugging the holes in his machine. Toward the end of November 63, three envoys from the Gallic tribe of the Allobrogues arrived in Rome. They were there to complain about the conduct of Murana, the governor of Transalpine Gaul. Typically speaking, the Roman Senate was not terribly sympathetic to foreign envoys complaining of abuse at the hands of a Roman official. Unless, of course, that official was on the outs with many of his peers and they had a score to settle. It does not appear that anyone had a real grievance with Murana at this time, however. The Allobrogue ambassadors most likely knew 
that they would not be able to achieve their objective, yet they were there to represent their people and do their best. Luckily for them, there was a conspiracy afoot in Rome, and the people leading it were completely and totally incompetent. The conspirators decided to approach the Allobroges, knowing that in a war, the Allobroges would make fantastic allies. They already had a reputation for ferocity in battle, and this reputation would actually only be enhanced during the 50s when Caesar fought the Gallic Wars and the Allobroges acquitted themselves quite well. Politically, bringing in barbarians, especially Gauls, who were the boogeymen of early Roman history, was about as appealing and politically brilliant as freeing slaves and giving them weapons, or setting fires in the middle of Rome. So, um, if this were to get out somehow that the conspirators were seeking barbarian Gallic aid, this would very much undermine their credibility even further and make them look like outright villains rather than merely petty aristocrats squabbling over power. For their part, the Allobroge ambassadors analyzed the situation and realized that while they might not have a high chance of pleading to the Romans using Logos about why Murena was a bad governor, they could play to Roman fears by offering up information on these dipshit conspirators. So they decided to go to Cicero, who was openly investigating Catiline's associates at this time, and they offered up information on the conspiracy. Naturally enough, Cicero said, let's do this. Cicero agreed to help the Allobroges, provided that they could get some written evidence that he could use before the Senate to prove his point. There were some people who suspected that Cicero was exaggerating the scope of this conspiracy and that he was perhaps really milking it for all it was worth. So he wanted to have some solid, irrefutable evidence that he could bring forward in order to get the entire Senate on his side and also to convince the people in the streets that the Catalinarians were bad guys. So he asked the Allobroges to get the senior leaders to meet with them and write letters of intent to the leadership back home. And shockingly, the conspirators agreed to do this. Lentulus, Cethegus, and other senior leaders got together in a house, I think it was Lentulus's house, and they all wrote letters with their own personal seals attached addressed to the leadership of the Allobroges, uh, explaining that they were all going to be great allies and friends and that they should stand together. They did use somewhat vague language about their intentions, but still they did exactly what Cicero hoped they would do. Then the Allobroges pretended that they were going back to Rome. They took a couple conspirators with them who would represent the senior leaders, and they were arrested on the Milvian Bridge to the north of Rome. The next day, on December 3rd, Cicero summoned the Senate to the Temple of Concordia and brought all of the various conspirators there and produced these letters. It would appear that Lentulus and his co uh, conspirators were very much dumbfounded by the appearance of these letters and assumed that Cicero had gotten them just by sheer bad luck. What this reminds me of is the BTK killer who was only caught because he decided he wanted to brag more about his crimes, so he wrote to the police via the newspaper and asked if it was okay and safe for him to send them a floppy disk with information on them. He asked them if they could trace it, and they basically said, no, we definitely can't trace that at all, so you're good to go with that, go for it. And of course, you can trace met uh, metadata on floppy disk, and that's exactly what the police did to find out who this guy was. So I feel like there's a sort of weird parallel between a serial killer in Kansas who was active in the 1970s and these conspirators led by Lentulus. Both of them were equally gullible and equally tightened the noose around their own necks. It should come as little surprise, but Lentulus, a man who became famous by showing Sulla his calf when he was asked to account for his financial misdeeds, once again defied the Senate by simply denying any knowledge of what was happening. He tried his best to play dumb and innocent, and it would appear that for a while it was actually working. 
the letters that Cicero was reading aloud were pretty vague. They didn't specifically say we're going to kill these people and seize power. They simply said that we will be your friends, we'll help you, uh, Rome and the Albrogues are the best of buddies, whatever it might be. So they did use some fairly non-committal, non-specific language to the point where if you're skeptical of what Cicero is trying to do, you would not really be convinced by these letters that there is a conspiracy afoot. Of course, if you already were convinced by Cicero, these letters would be completely convincing. So far, Cicero had not landed the knockout blow, and somehow Lentula Sura had managed to keep pace with him and not get exposed. When Cicero asked about the conversation that he and his fellows had with the Allobrogues, Lentula Sura seems to have been feeling a little bit cocky, and he was completely convinced that the Allobrogues were on his side, and that the fact that Cicero had arrested them on the Milvian Bridge meant that they were still intent upon going back home and winning support for the conspiracy. So he said, we did have a conversation. Why don't you ask the Allobrogues what it was about? Because it was completely innocent and above board. So let's call the Allobrogues out and have them tell us all what went down. So Lentula Sura was sitting there completely confident, thinking that his great good friends, the Allobrogues, would back up his story. And instead, the Allobrogues told exactly what happened. And while they were talking, Cicero later wrote that Sulla, I mean, not Sulla, but Sura seemed to kind of implode and his face just fell. And after that point, a lot of his co-conspirators also really broke down and either admitted guilt or their face told the whole story. And it was obvious that they had been caught red handed in the act of conspiracy. On December 3rd, 63 BCE, at the Temple of Concordia, Lentula Sura was as humiliated or more humiliated than any Roman who ever lived. Early in the proceedings, while Cicero was still reading the letters of the conspirators, before reading Lentulus's letter, he noted the heroism of Lentulus's grandfather, whose face appeared on Lentulus's seal. And then he compared the heroism of the elder Lentulus with the treason of the grandson. While at this time it was not completely clear that Lentulus was guilty, Cicero was building up a case, and by invoking one of Lentulus's most famous ancestors, he was showing a contrast which was in no way favorable to the current Lentulus. When the Allobrogues relayed their story, Cicero later wrote that Lentulus seemed to implode in front of everyone, and after Lentulus was completely discredited and disheartened, his fellow conspirators also fell apart. It seems that none of them were quite so shameless as Legs Lentulus. That same day, as the proceedings were wrapping up, Lentulus was forced to remove his purple trip toga, renounce his praetorship, and adopt a plain white toga, indicating that he no longer held any rank or office. Between all of these various events, it is safe to say that Lentulus's pride was put to death. He himself, however, would last a few more days. For about seven days following the events of December 3rd, the Senate met and debated the fate of the conspirators. Lentulus and his fellow conspirators, for their part, were being kept in solitary confinement at the houses of various prominent senators. Lentulus Sura himself actually stayed at Cicero's house, and it's unclear whether he would have been happy with this or not. On the one hand, by being kept with the current reigning consul, it did show that Lentulus Sura was thought to be the most important of the conspirators, but on the other hand, Cicero by this point was no doubt a bitter enemy. So it's unclear how Lentulus would have felt about this or whether he even had enough pride left to care one way or the other. The intense debate that broke out over whether to keep these men imprisoned around Italy or to put them to death summarily without a trial took place at some point between the December 3rd meeting and their execution. The two primary speakers in this debate were two relatively junior men, Julius Caesar, a current praetor, and also the new Pontifex Maximus, 
and then Cato the Younger, who was a junior magistrate. Ultimately, the view of Cato that these men should be put to death summarily prevailed, and Cicero decided to use his authority as consul under the Senatus Consultum Ultimum to execute Lentulus and a few others without a trial. At the time, this was very much praised, but as we'll see, it came back to bite Cicero in the ass a few years later. It was customary for the Romans to lead prisoners to their execution in a way which showed them some respect. Cicero led Lentulus to the Tullianum by hand, and then the ex-consul was lowered down into the prison. There were no stairs at the Tullianum at the time, and someone had to be lowered through the roof. The person was usually blindfolded or in some way bound, and then a slave would come up and strangle them from behind. Most likely by the time that he was strangled, Lentula Sura was done with this world, just like Tommy was so at the end of the room. Cicero uh, then went to the crowd and announced simply, Wixerunt, which in Latin means they have lived. Cicero was hailed as a hero by a cheering crowd, and he was accompanied by a massive retinue and a kind of almost mock or stripped-down triumph. And later he would write that this was the greatest moment of his entire life, when he had saved the Republic from the evils of Catiline and had really preserved all that was great about the Senate and people of Rome. However, as we'll see, Cicero's actions against Lentulus Sura and his cohorts did come at a high price later down the line. Lentulus Sura and his colleagues were dead. However, one could argue that they did get some limited measure of revenge against the consul who had investigated and put them to death. While Cicero was immensely popular in December of 63, that level of fame that he achieved in that moment quickly faded as people realized that his deeds weren't actually that great and the threat posed by Catiline and Lentulus Sura and all the others had never really been existential. However, Cicero, if anything, seems to have really inflated his achievements over time in his own mind. He tried to capitalize on the fame of this incident by publishing the third and fourth Catalinarian orations, which he never actually delivered, where he really built up this case against Catiline and pretended that he humiliated Catiline again and again in front of the Senate. Later, he decided that his deeds were so amazing that there should be an epic poem about his handling of the conspiracy of Catiline. He approached every epic poet in Rome, and all of them turned him down. They were more interested in great battles and journeys against all odds. And Cicero's story didn't have those elements. There was no clash of good and evil or anything of that nature. However, Cicero very much did see himself as the upholder of all things virtuous and Catiline as the manifestation of all that was evil. So he decided to write his own epic poem about himself. And this poem has not survived to the present. However, all of the ancients who read it agreed that this was perhaps the worst poem ever written. So Cicero really embarrassed himself with his vainglorious ramblings, and he also wrote incessantly about the time he saved the Republic in his letters. We know about this because we have the letters that he wrote to his friend Atticus, who lived in Greece, and Cicero took the opportunity to brag about what he did with the Catalinarian conspiracy every chance he got, even when it had no bearing on whatever he was talking about at that moment. By 56, Cicero's political position had deteriorated quite a bit. This was about four years into the First Triumvirate, and Cicero, while he did have some connections with Pompey, was not on great terms with Caesar or Crassus. Caesar had empowered Clodius, one of the popular gang leaders of the 50s, and Clodius also happened to hate Cicero, who had made a number of comments about Clodius's degeneracy and also about the looseness of his sister Clodia. So Clodius took Cicero to trial on the grounds that Cicero had executed Roman citizens without securing a proper trial. And by the way, this was accurate, 
and the SCU, while it did give the console the ability to act in a way that was extraordinary, it did not clearly state that consoles could put Roman citizens to death without a trial. So Cicero had committed a legal wrong, and now he was called to account for it, something that he never thought would happen since the Senate agreed with him that these men needed to be put to death. However, while Cato and others thought that Cicero did the right thing, he never went through the proper channel of having a trial before the executions. What really happened is that Cicero was exiled, and although he did return and regained favor, he was always haunted by the experience, and also he was deeply despondent and depressed while he was in exile. Many of his supposed friends, including Pompey, were rather indifferent to his suffering and to the fact that he had been unfairly, in his mind, exiled from Rome. Cicero was only comfortable in the law courts and Senate House in Rome, and his time of exile was pure misery for him. It was a humbling experience to some extent, but at the same time, it's unclear if Cicero really learned that much. Of course, in the very long term, Cicero still won out of the conspiracy of Catiline because we still read his accounts of this event, and his accounts also greatly influenced the way that Sallust wrote about these events 25 years after the fact. So uh, Cicero won in the short term and the long run, but Lentula did have a small bit of revenge when Cicero incurred exile for having executed him without a full trial. Lentula is an interesting man, although, of course, it would be impossible to claim that he is one of the great men of his time. He was a key supporter of Catiline and the sole senior magistrate who backed Catiline's conspiracy. As such, he does at least demonstrate that this conspiracy could appeal to more than just dissolute young men. Dissolute middle-aged men could potentially sign up as well. Lentulus Sura's political journey shows how complex the dynamics of the Roman factions truly were. As I mentioned earlier, Sulla purged all of his opponents, but the space that they had occupied politically was wide open, and that was where there was potential to gain support. Lentulus Sura, Antonius Hybrida, Catiline himself, and others moved into that space precisely because that's where the opportunities were. So this victorious coalition of Sulla ultimately ended up not staying together precisely because Sulla's solution for the problems of the day was strictly and narrowly partisan in nature and did not understand the dynamics of Roman politics. More so than either Cicero or Catiline himself, I also have argued in this video that the man most directly responsible for the failure of the Catilinarian conspiracy is none other than Lentulus Sura. Just to make sure the point is clear enough, I also am arguing that while Lentulus Sura is not quite as incompetent as Metellus Scipio, it is a close contest, and if I ever do a tier ranking video of figures from the late Republic, Lentulus Sura is sure to end up in the F tier. I can think of no other possible ranking for him. Anyhow, this has been Thersites the Historian. I will be back in the near future with more content of this nature, and I will see you all around.